So with our students, when we did um, all of our modeling, when we did our buildings, they are all done by students. When we went on that journey, um, you know, Autodesk kind of did a case study on us. Um, it was back in 20, we started in 2008. So that kind of gives you an idea how early we started. We were back in 2008. Um, and so we work with our local at that time, our local all dust reseller, which was uh, Cal Blue. Um, and so they came, we had six students. They came um, and worked with us, train our students on how to use Revit. Um, because we're, we're a research institution. Uh, we do have a college of engineering, but we don't have an architectural school. So we had, so none of our students were using AutoCAD. They were using AutoCAD, but they weren't using Revit. So, um, so they kind of showed them how to model the first building. Once they learned how to model the first building, they just start you know, going and modeling the re remaining building. So we started in 2008. Um, make sure, okay, we still got 10 minutes. But um, so we started in 2008, um, got a third of our campus done, and I forgot what the time frame was. Um, and then um, in 2011 is when we went down the road of adding equipment. But they just basically did that. They took, they, um, we had, all of our buildings had simple floor plans. All simple floor plans are in CAD. So they start from that, that, that point. So they took all our CAD files for simple floor plans and basically went out and start building the Revit model from the simple floor plan. So, you know, they took the architectural drawings, the CAD files, went out, did measurements, and just start building the models. Um, now, the thing that we told them was we were not trying to build it to like be the exact. So we just use all generic libraries. So windows, doors, walls, everything was from the generic library. So they just built the model that way. The thing they spent more time on was the mullions, things like that. They want the building, the exterior to look like the exterior of the building. So that's where all their focus was. So when they were going, picking the building materials, they were trying to pick it as close as possible to be an exact replica of what was actually there. So if someone was to look at the model, it would be a close rendition of the actual building, per se. So that's where most of their time was spent, but it was basically stairs, all that stuff was just generic. Um, because like I said, it was not our purpose to use those models for construction. So I think that's where you know, most people have to decide what is your goal? Is your goal to kind of build a model to be for construction purposes, or is your goal to kind of have something just to have a 3D rendition of the building? So our approach was we just wanted something to be a representation of the building. So that's kind of why we have two different programs where we have our BIM for existing and BIM for new. Um, but that's how we started. So we start with the students. Um, and once they got trained, you know, Autodesk kind of helped. Um, and then um, Cal Blue Auto Industrial Seller, they kind of helped them model the first building. They took it from there. Then I came on board in 2013. Um, and then our um, Janie, who oversees our facility records, she has a background in Revit. So when she came on board, that's when it really took off. Um, and I was telling people the story. Our program really excelled when we brought two international students on board um, because they just had experience, um, their background was in construction management. So, and they were already using Revit over in their, you know, we had one, we had one student from Rome, another student from the Dominican saying? Republic. And so I they were know. grad students and they what just had experience with Revit and that's when our program really oh, took off. Yeah. And so, excellent. when we started adding equipment to our models, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, KG that's when they would go out, um, the first thing we would do in Boston, is when they would go out to company. do an audit of the building to, to see what equipment is in the building. We gave them a printout of all the equipment <laughs> in the building and they would go out yeah. and basically audit to verify if that equipment that was in our CMMS was actually in the building. You know, because sometimes nice. our trades, electrician may, me a yeah. um, well, mechanical guy may replace colleagues. a pump. Probably so we want to make sure before we start adding this stuff in our buildings, we want to make sure the stuff <laughs> is accurate in our CMMS. So they will go out to all our buildings and they will write down, you know, they will have the printout of the equipment and then they will scratch out if something was not accurate. And then. Name plate under. Yep. Correct. So they had an iPad with them, and they would go out, and we basically, and this is where your students, they go a little bit up and beyond, 
So we used to say, just take a scratch, just sketch where it is. Well, they had to actually go out and measure where the actual pumps was. In the, but we didn't tell them to do it. We just told them, if it's in the corner, show it in the corner. But they were going out and actually measuring where that pump was um, to get an accurate spot where that pump resided. So that's what they were doing. So they were actually taking the light out there, measuring everything and showing it up. And then when they were grabbing a model, and this is what I tell people too, you don't have to go the route that we went, is they were going and grabbing the actual pump. So we use B&G pumps, Bell & Gossett. So they would go to Bell & Gossett's website, actually pull the model of that actual pump out, and they create libraries like that. So we have, so every pump that's in our model is an exact model of that pump from Bell & Gossett because they were pulling it from their site. Uh, same thing with the air handlers. You can just do a square. They actually custom did each air handler because when the trays go to click on it, they want a the tray to know that's the actual air handler. So they would go and, you know, model air handler because most of our air handlers are old. Oh, my. And so a lot of those manufacturers are not around anymore. <laughs> so they were used drawings to actually create the, the model of the air handler. And, and that's how we started. And so we what, have what libraries of you all must be Texas, Texas of the models that they used what do you um, do there? for each piece of equipment. So that's kind of how our journey started in that way. Um, but like I said, that's kind of, and we've finished oh, cool. now. All of our buildings have all the equipment in them um, for all of our general fund buildings. Um, okay. So we have all of our pumps, and basically, right. what we worked on is not Make every sure, piece, not uh, every piece of equipment is in our models for existing. We only want to add equipment. equipment that our guys That's touch on a routine basis. So air handlers, and pumps, fans, chillers. JCI we don't put electrical panels sort of in. We don't put lighting in. We don't Might put carpet. We don't do any of that stuff. Because carpet, we make service every 10 years. Hang in with us, though. So, <laughs> you, you know, it's not really something that we need to have in our model, yeah, yeah. in our existing building cool. models, you know, because it's something that we're going to change every single day. Well, I can so those are things I always tell people that <laughs> if you're going to do this, it's really important to sit down with your trades folks and find out what's important to them. Because um, to them, this is stuff they touch, you know. Uh, new is a completely different story. That's, that's what we did. And that was our approach, um, and we felt comfortable with that approach. So right now, all of our buildings now on campus have all air handlers, all fans, um, chillers, and those things are in them. And that's kind of what, how we did. So like I said, I may, next year, I'll probably try to submit and, you know, do it again, you know, and represent, because it's been a while since I, because I know I see my name flying around in Western, you know, but uh, our approach is a little different. Um, and so, you know, we've always invited people to our campus. I don't know if you guys saw Maria's University of Tennessee. She came to our campus and that's, you know, she took the information that we gave him and she kind of doing what she's, you know, doing for University of Tennessee. Um, and I think Gabe's presentation, you know, I'm, I met Gabe because I presented at TMA. He's a web TMA user. Um, and we present TMA and same thing, he kind of took what Pepper, what was important from our, what we kind of helped develop and, and took it to develop for them. So I'm always open book. I always tell people, if there's anything you want to know, ask me, I'll tell you. Um, I'll share whatever costs. I, can, I, have a, I have a slide that shows the cost we spent for our students. We spent $60,000 to do <laughs> that initial thing of mining all of our buildings on campus. So six students working we were allowed to work them, you know, with their, <laughs> within the labor laws, but yeah, it was about 60 grand for us to use our students to build that initial set of models. Um, but I think that's the thing that I think people are struggling with is where do we start? How do we go? And that's why I would say I should come back and do a presentation to help people understand, you know, you gotta find where your starting point is because we jumped in with both feet like Lynn talked about yesterday. So we jumped in both feet and ran, but this is the direction we went. Now, it may not be right for everybody, but that was the direction we went. Because we wanted to understand what our existing building was to kind of help develop what we want our new buildings to be. And that's kind of how we developed our BIM execution plan, based on what we did with our existing buildings. So, uh, it's not what we're going to be talking about today, but, you know, no, thanks for your question. Like I said, I'll be more happy to share that information with you guys. Um, but I talked about, you know, maybe doing one of these things to help people. Because I, I walk around, I see people kind of like overwhelmed. <laughs> I 
at what others have done. And so if I can help in any way to help people kind of get a start, I'm more than welcome, more than willing to do that. So always feel free to ask me a question. If you have any question on how, how we start with BIM and where we're at with BIM, and, you know, feel free to ask. I'd be more happy to share. So sorry about that. But. I think we'll get started. Pleasure to introduce Devon Miller, from Building Commission Specialist from Western Michigan University, and uh, Mike Crossan from KGS Building. Yep. So thank, thank you. you. So um, you know today I'm um, not going to be talking to you guys about BIM, unfortunately, um, but um, we're going to kind of talk about a pilot um, where we are with uh, FDD, fault detection and diagnostics, and how how we're using data um, to help better understand what's going on in our buildings from an energy standpoint, um, utilizing information from our BAS. Um, and so um, right now we're in a three-year uh, three pilot with um, KGS Buildings, and I won't steal much of Mike, but that's kind of what we're going to be sharing with you guys today. So I'm going to let Mike kind of give you guys a little bit more, uh, more information on FDD, and then I'll kind of give you guys behind the scenes of what information, how much it costs, and the set type of ROI we're seeing with incorporating um, our FDD program at Western. So with Thanks, that, turn it over to Mike. Hey, everybody. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name's Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Um, disclaimer right off the bat, I have a business degree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the marketing end of this. Ask questions. I'm not sure I'm always going to have the answers, but I'll get them for you. Fair enough. So we're KGS Buildings. We're based in the Boston area. We're a software company. We're a building data analytics software company. We've been around for seven or eight years. Uh, privileged to serve over 425 clients globally, most of which are universities. And one of our, uh, one of our more important and successful clients, standing right, right next to me right here, Devon Miller in Western Michigan. So, Boy, you know, there's such a buzz in higher ed about smart campuses, the Internet of Things, uh, the accelerating pace of change that's coming at us. Um, also, you know, the role that analytics is, is helping to transform organizations and, and deal with these things. You know, some, some examples that come to mind is uh, other conferences I've, I've been at recently, uh, APA, uh, for instance, at their... Uh, their annual conference in Denver just, uh, what was that, two, three weeks ago, mm -hmm. Devon? Yes. There was a panel discussion uh, with three university facility vice presidents, also happened to be three APA presidents. Devon was part of that panel. And, um, you know, they were talking about these topics specifically. Just about a month before that, at the Ontario chapter of APA, their annual conference, the whole conference theme was the smart campus. And we were delighted to be invited to speak there. And actually, APA's leader, their executive vice president, Lander Medlin, was there. And, you know, challenging us in our jobs, you know, in order to be successful, you know, and deal with these dynamics, you got to think differently, you have to act differently. And she was, you know, kind of challenging all of us to do that. And even here at, at the CFTA conference, our our keynote speaker, Lynn Allen, who I thought was really, really good, by the way. She was pretty entertaining. And, but she was touching on these things as well as uh, yesterday's blue ribbon panel discussion, talking about you know, the campus of the future. It was at Futura University, all of this stuff. So what Devon and I hope to share with you, just some, some real world experiences and some technology that is helping, to, helping you to use data that you have today, that can drive value today and help position you for all these things, uh, all these changes that you know, we're going to deal with uh, coming down the road. So you know, industry studies organizations such as uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, IDC, et cetera, you know, they've done studies and they tell us, they give us, uh, they give us these statistics. 20% you know, of our maintenance and energy costs could be, could be reduced through predictive uh, maintenance. 40% of our building occupants are not happy with the, the temperature and humidity level in, in their space. Um, last one's pretty compelling. 80% of the equipment in our buildings are failing uh, too soon, you know, before end of life. That's a challenge. 
that we're helping our clients deal with today. At the same time, these other dynamics are going on. Um, well documented, you know, deferred maintenance is a big challenge in higher ed. Uh, most of our systems are at or past end of life. Tip of the hat to the maintenance organizations that, you know, through hard work, dedication, knowledge, uh, have been able to take systems that are only supposed to last 20 years and made them last 30, 40 years. Pretty amazing stuff. But I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Budgets are tightening. You know, the, the spigot's being tight, tight, tightened up from state funding. Enrollment's down in pretty much every state. So even more so, people are being asked to do more with less. At the same time, the resource pool is shrinking. When I refer to the resource pool, I'm talking about the, the, the lack of pe young people starting their careers that are going into the H HVAC um, career path, you know, that have the talent. That's happening at the same time there's an alarming number of existing professionals that every month, every year are retiring. So higher ed leadership is, is noticing that and saying, you know, <laughs> we got some things you need to deal with here. You know, while we know HVAC is, is a large percent of the deferred maintenance equation, all of that represents risk to universities to attract and keep the best students, best and brightest students, faculty, uh, the ever important research programs, and as facility management professionals, risk to ensure that our facilities continue to operate at a very high level of performance and that the spaces that we manage, you know, really align and support with the educational mission of our schools. So that's really, you know, mm -hmm. the challenge that we're helping folks uh, work with. Other studies tell us that, you know, relative to cost, you know, to react to something that's broken is exponentially more expensive um, than it is through a preventive, or, and even, even more so if once you move into that predictive model using the data you have. This is a quote from... Um, Don Guckert, he was, this, this, this was actually something I wrote down when he was part of that panel discussion mm -hmm. out in Denver. So he's vice president of facilities at the University of Iowa. And he said, before FDD, right, we, we really, we were data rich, but we were information poor. We didn't have the insight that we needed, um, and we were losing opportunity to reduce our energy consumption, uh, really move the needle as far as, you know, uh, doing, working smarter, driving down operational costs, and making sure that we're laser focused on committing our resources to the most important things, the things that are gonna have the most impact on our organization. So reactive mode, you're playing, you know, it's squeaky wheel, it's almost <laughs> like whack-a-mole. You know, you're just putting out the hottest fires. Uh, less significant things are sneaking to the front of the line, and, and, and through you know, this type of technology, using data you have today, um, you can stay laser focused on your priorities. This is something that really can work, you know, and benefit folks uh, across the, uh, the FM enterprise, too. I mean, it's going to help uh, the maintenance and control technicians, right? They can work, they make their life better. They know what they're looking for before they climb up on a ladder, like uh, somebody here at the conference said, a lot of our buildings are historical, right? Know what you're looking for before you're cutting holes in things. Uh, it's going to help energy and utility professionals, you know, have to hit sustainability goals, reduce carbon footprint, and also from a commissioning perspective. And I know Devon can, can speak at length about that, both new construction where you want to catch things while they're still under warranty, after occupancy, you know, as, as equipment uh, continues to drift and so forth. FDD is not brand new. Been around for a while, right? Long while, actually. But in its infancy, each instance was really a one-off, customized implementation where extensive, you know, hundreds, even thousands of rules had to be written unique to your buildings, the equipment in, in your buildings. Then they had to be tweaked, tested, and maintained over time. You needed some resources to make it work. You need, either needed a large staff within the university FM group to do it, or you needed some deep pockets to hire a consultant, and it just wasn't a sustainable model. Fast forward to, um, I like to call it FDD 2.0. Also find myself using the term <laughs> diagnostics as a service. Yeah. Because, you know, where this technology is today, it's, 
It's really a, a centrally managed uh, diagnostic library. The vendor maintains it. Uh, and it's shared across the entire client base. Um, that means, so what's the why? It means it goes in faster, scales faster, it is sustainable, it's a lot less expensive. Um, today's technology will um, show you root cause. So again, the technician has a clue what he, what he or she's looking for um, before he goes out to the field. There's a lot of, a lot of dialogue. Um, the universities that we talk to about, well, we're not ready for FDD, right? We've got to build <laughs> this data lake, and we've got to sanitize and standardize and make sure our naming conventions are all consistent. And there's a lot of time being spent on this and a, and a lot of money being spent on it. Um, we, we're proof positive that you, you can start now Right? Use, the, use the data that you have in your building automation systems today, drive immediate value, and then you know, continue to build your data lake. I mean, this is a journey. Um, continue to build your data lake going forward. That's what we're doing with Stanford. That's what we're doing with a, a lot of our other clients. The way that we work with our clients is you know, we integrate directly to your existing uh, BAS platforms, and that can be, you know, anything from Honeywell to Schneider to Johnson Controls, ALC, you name it. That's one of the rubs, one of the challenges that we help clients address because um, most universities, are, they're going to have more than one BAS platform. University of Arizona has 16, uh, but I don't know how they get to 16, but they have no way to, you know, view across all those platforms, uh, consolidate analyze and utilize that data. And we can do that through a direct integration to all those platforms. And we do it, it's pretty simple. It's just through a software gateway we wrote that we drop on your existing equipment. So there's no, no new hardware brought into the equation and all the hidden costs um, that that involves. And, and, we, and we move the data through just standard data protocols, transfer protocols such as BACnet, Modbus, et cetera. All right, and one, once we've got that integration set up, what we're doing is we're pulling your BAS, your HVAC equipment, your BAS systems every five minutes, and it's a one-way push out to the cloud, outbound only, outbound only. And that usually makes the IT folks very happy in terms of you know, <laughs> security and all that other very by. important <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, we have clients, you know, defense contractors, healthcare organizations, universities. Um, this is tight, this is secure, it works. Our whole implementation process is tip for a typical university is about three months. Uh, university of Iowa had 20 buildings, phase one, up and running six months, getting valuable analytics from us. Phase two took you know, another 20 buildings, another six months. So just comparatively speaking to you know, older FDD solutions where that, that would have taken years to implement. Um, and the jury's in. Here's, uh, this is um, the Department of Energy, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, their Smart Energy, Energy Analytics Campaign. This is their URL. Um, there's a ton of really good information there. Um, I wanted to share it with you in case you want to go check it out. Um, but the results are in. Um, through that study involving 27 organizations, six, I'll call it 680 buildings, 94 million square feet, they're seeing that um, they use a broad term, EMIS, Energy Management Information Systems, a subset of which is FDD. Um, you know, as much as 19% energy reduction over, over four years. So the ROI is there. And by the way, they, they just gave out seven uh, best practice awards uh, through this program, three of which were FDD awards. And all, all three clients that get the FDD awards were, were with us. Just kind of swept the category. Paradigm shift. This is some statistics from the University of Iowa, where we happen to be integrated with their work order system. And this is three quarters worth of information where we're starting to see the volume of work orders as well as the nature of the work orders. These are, these are work orders generated by FDD. Um, so the work orders are going down. It's starting to become more predictive rather than reactive. 
and they're seeing some tremendous operational improvements and cost savings, not to mention you know, $1.4 million in energy <coughs> savings. Another case study, MIT, they rolled this out across uh, 90 buildings. Oops. A lot of words there, that's all, that's all I'm gonna say about that slide. Um, they kind of, um, you know, it, it evolved. Uh, as to how they were using FDD over time. First, it was to you know, help manage everyday repair and maintenance. And after they got that step uh, well underway, then they expanded it. So we're going to make this part of our continuous or monitoring-based commissioning program. And then they incorporated it into their energy programs. And now it's even part of, uh, they have third parties using it when they do their recommissioning. Um, it's constant monitoring instead of uh, a snapshot in time, uh, clear review of what's going on after occupancy. I think uh, it was Anna talking to TCO earlier, was saying 80% of cost of ownership comes after the buildings are occupied. But it's, it's not to say that you don't want to still you know, recommission, put boots on the, on the ground, but this is certainly going to help and tighten things up. MIT, th this is a this is a, these stats are from a three-year project they did with their utility, Eversource. So Eversource, the utility, they validated this. They compared all of MIT's energy-related projects over a three-year period. This is us, monitoring-based commissioning software. You can see it had the fastest payback, half a year, with some very significant uh, numbers behind it as well. So like I said, the jury's in. That kind of sets the stage for <laughs> My friend, client, colleague, yes. Devon, um, this is actually snapshots from their, their FDD um, database in, in Clockworks. Yeah. So um, I always like to start with the why, because that's always been a question, why do we do this? Um, like I said, my background, I'm a building commissioning specialist for Western Michigan University, so I'm the building commissioning specialist for Western Michigan University. <laughs> okay, so what that means is I oversee commissioning for all new construction, renovations, just me. Um, sometimes I'll sub it out, sometimes I'll do it myself. Um, but the misnomer that people, I guess, don't understand is that just because you're commissioning a building doesn't mean it's done, that it's gonna run and operate that way for the life of the building, no. Um, so my job is to really understand what's going on in our facilities. So one of the things that we normally would do is we would go, and when I came on board at Western in 2013, we kind of reinstituted our retro commissioning program. Um, that means I'll go out, hire a third party, come through our buildings, and basically I'll go through and go through all the existing equipment, all the systems, to find out you know, what things are not working, in, you know, not working as the building was original, or how the building is being um, operated today. As you guys know, a building is built, we have our OPR, owner's price requirements, how that building is supposed to operate, over time it changes. This is a way for me to understand what's going on in our building. So we implemented this program um, in phase three. Um, it really kind of helps us understand what's going on. So this is a dashboard. So we started, when we started this program, we added, the building that we added on to this program was our lead platinum building. It's the only platinum building we have on campus, um, which is the birthplace of Western. Uh, Heritage Hall, uh, 1903, 1905, historically renovated in 2014, Lee Platinum Building. So that was the first building we onboarded in here because it was commissioned, but I wanted to make sure that it maintains its platinum because it's the most energy efficient on campus. I would tell you within one year of this thing being implemented, that building had a lot of problems. Platinum Building, it was commissioned, had problems. Okay, this thing found it because a lot of things that we were finding is um, we were finding valves, actuators that were getting lost. So even though actually it was saying to BAS, the valve was closed, it was not closed. You're not gonna alarm. Your BAS is not gonna alarm on that unless you have a high temperature or something like that, but the valve says it's closed, it's just slightly cracked. You're supposed to be discharging 55 degree discharge air and you're actually discharging 70 degree air and you wonder why people are complaining, hmm. this would flag that. Yeah. And so we were going through finding those valves. These were some Honeywell valves that just got lost over time. They kept getting lost. So what they required us to do is go in there, reset the valve, and then it'll find this place again. So that was most of the things that we commonly found. Other thing we found is, for whatever reason, 
uh, air handling unit. It says it's supposed to be off, not off. How our system works is anything, if a VAV box is, 50, is over 50 CFM, air handler will run. Now why would, a, why would a VAV box be open, why would we be supplying 50 CFM to space? Well, it could be a fail ox sensor, it could be anything. So this system has helped flagging those things. So uh, I'm not gonna get into the dashboard, but you can kind of see, basically this right here tells us all the faults it's finding and what it's costing us each day for that fault. So what we give them is we have a cogen plant. So they know our operating costs for every fiscal year. And so when it finds a fault, this is our actual cost for that fault. And so what I basically do is I go through um, and find out, you know, what things, you know, are I should tackle. So these are tasks I have already created, you know, that are in the system. These are diagnostics. So um, now what we do is, one of the things when I onboarded this, I didn't want to do is I didn't want to overwhelm our trades guys, you know, because this thing's going to find, trust me, when you, when you onboard this, you're going to, it's going to flood you with a whole bunch of things it's going to find. So one of the things I want to do is, you know, create a whole bunch of work orders and get our trades guys upset because, you know, so what basically I do is I go out and find and prioritize which ones I want to create. So we vet each one of these items. So anything comes up, I create a task, and um, like I said, it's myself, and I have another controls guy that sits at our control center. I'll send him 10 work, 10 tasks a week, no more, I think he can kind of handle 10. He'll go to vet each one. And basically, if it's saying, hey, this thing, this issue is happening, like this particular run here, it says air handler operating while all zones unoccupied, non-operational stop. So it just means that something is causing this air handler run outside of its schedule. So I'll create a task for him to go and verify, is that actually something that's happening and what's happening? And so what he'll do is dig into it um, and find out what's causing it. The nice thing that Mike was saying is this keeps a trend, it keeps a log of all of our data, but it's not bugging down our server. It's in the cloud. So as a commissioning agent, we always tell to try trend stuff. So if you guys know your BAS system, when you start putting trend logs in, your server space starts filling up, I don't have to worry about that because this is all our data is in the cloud. So I don't have to worry about losing space on our server. So that's a nice thing to, that I like about this as well. So when he goes to invent something, you know, he says that, okay, you know, yes, this is a valid issue. I found what the problem was. He'll say that I created a work order for such and such to go fix something or he fixed it. Then what I would basically do is send a service request back to KGS, let them know what, our, what the issue was, you know, what he did to repair it, and they will respond back to me and say, yep, that issue was all, and I can validate that that cost was actual, the actual savings that we received for that item. Um, so, so this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, um, this R here, you know, so all the categories that we get, you see E, C, M, E is for any energy related. Everything is rated from one to 10, 10 being worst case, worst issue you should attack first. Uh, C is comfort issues. And then M is maintenance. So valve is gonna fail or something like that. So, so that's what they do. They write um, analytics for each one of those issues and we go and vet each one. Um, and then, like I said, for the first year, uh, our ROI was, we spent a little over 40K uh, one year payback on the first year. And that was, uh, we had one, our Heritage Hall building, um, and then we added 34 air handlers that were on an AX server. We're a Niagara platform, is what we run. So, um, and so that was like the first year. Second year we onboarded um, three more buildings, uh, another year payback. Um, and now we're in year three, uh, our pilot, um, we spent uh, roughly 100K. And now we're in that third year now, so we'll see. Um, so this is kind of where we're at. Um, but like I said, it's really helped us, because like I said, we were always reacting to this stuff. It's like, you know, it's hot in here, it's this, you know. Um, so we were always reacting. Now this allows me to be a little bit more um, proactive and addressing issues before a valve fails. 
And it's because they're telling, let me know that, hey, you should go check this out because something's not quite right here. Um, I know one item that was an issue that um, they were flagging, but it was not a, it wasn't a valid issue was um, because we're in Michigan, you know, we have a lot of cold seasons, so we don't have a lot of, <laughs> we got about six months maybe of heating maybe, uh, or hot summer. We shut our chillers down. Our chillers, we turn our chillers on April 15th, depending weather, depending, and we shut our chillers down November 15th, so our plants are down. So come November, there's no chill water. So if we need cooling space, outside air. So five minutes, thanks. So um, they were flagging that, you know, they were seeing that some of our valves were open, so it was calling for cooling, and they were flagging that, hey, you got chill water running? And we were like, no, mm -hmm. that's not a valid issue because our chillers are shut off. So that was an issue we vetted with them that it's not an actual savings because we don't have chill water running. Um, so they respond. So if I, send, if I send a service request from them, I get two emails. Free email I get is a matter of seconds, let me know, hey, we got your service request. Within five minutes, I get actual servant, one of their guys that work on our account, sends me an email, Devon, yes, we see that issue has been resolved. But good point so, of clarification, I mean, we're not actually going into their BAS yep. platform and doing any programming. Yep. You know, this isn't a loss leader for us. Um, we're, we're not doing the fix. Yep. Um, thank you. Yep. yep. So this is the uh, last thing, so I want to get to questions. This is an impact report that these guys send me, um, or they don't send me, I have access to it. So right now, you can see that I have issues. I got right now, identify uh, avoidable costs. This is actual that I have right now of items out there around 58,000 that I can be looking into. So when I get back to the office on Monday, I'll be issuing some service You're requests welcome, to, <laughs> to get some of these issues resolved. So these are actual numbers. And so, um, and I know the question is gonna be, well, how do we fund the first one? Um, so I'm gonna get off of this and then open up for questions because I wanna make sure I answer any questions. But funding wise, we are probably one of the few that have a green revolving fund. That's how we funded the initial phase is through our green revolving fund. All the costs that we save, avoidable costs from here, go right back into that fund. That's how we are able to fund our ECM, yeah. all of our energy conservation yeah. projects and so forth. Don, Don uh, Garkett and the Iowa team, he says, I was being hit with budget cuts, so there wasn't anything I could do about it. He says, my answer you know, to keep up our, our level of performance is through technology. We're gonna yep. do more with less. We're gonna invest in this, so. and they're making it work. So I'm a, um, yeah, we're open up to questions, so feel free. I know we went through it pretty quickly. Um, kind of half an hour goes pretty quick. Yeah. So please, questions. Uh, a lot of mechanical rooms don't have uh, web access, right? And you're looking for a pushback in regards to what's happening at the area level. So you guys, you guys have to get internet access and you only have mechanical rooms uh, to make that happen? Or how, how's the data being reported back to the area level back to? to uh, well, it's through the BAS platform. We're, we're, we're tight. Yes, we're not going directly to each individual piece of equipment. It's through the platform. That's yep. where we integrate too. Yep. I mean, the data is there. It's locked up. You just can't get at it. And Mike, you had a slide up there that, that talked about um, root cause analysis. I mean, is that something where if there's a trend related to um, a hot or cold call within a room or an area reoccurring over time and time? Mm -hmm. Who's doing that root cause analysis to say, oh, oh it's it, related? It, it's, it's all automatic in, in, in the technology, in the software. And unlike a, 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 a BAS alarm, um, again, we're, we're polling data every five minutes, but we'll, we'll trend it over a day or a week before we report back to you. We, we, just, we don't want it to be just another alarm. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of the things that he flags, I'm not getting an alarm on. So, and what they do is they, their analytics is based on, so one of the things I have to send them is that they make me fill out, uh, it's like a matrix, it's like a equipment matrix of, you know, what equipment I have I want to bring on, and then I send them my temperature control submittal with all the sequence and stuff, and then they build their analytics off of that. Now, the important thing is, like all of us, as long as you have an accurate record of your sequence of operations, no one went and changed something because we change stuff and we don't document the change. So I may send them something and they're writing an analytic on it and it comes out, oh, yeah, we changed that. And so that's why I go through and work with them to vet those yeah. issues. But they write the analytics off the information you give them. So any temperature control similar that has your sequence of operations, they're building analytics off of that. So that's why I'm saying, you're not gonna alarm on everything. Yeah. They're just gonna flag something that is seeing, hey, you know, like one of the things they send yeah. me is like economizer. 
We don't control humidity in a lot of our buildings. Classroom buildings, we're, you know, unless it's something that requires specific humidity control, we're doing temperature, temperature comparison. Yeah. So one of the things they may flag is, hey, your kind of miser, you may want to adjust it up to 70 degrees or something as your lockout temperature for your kind of miser. And I will come back and go, well, I don't know about 70, we'll try 65 and see if how that would work because we don't want to go, because people may complain. <laughs> so and again, um, another point of clarification, we're, we're not writing new analytics for yeah. each new client as they come aboard or as each existing client is bringing on you know, more equipment. It's, it's, a, it's a data library, yeah. analytic library that's already there. We're tweaking it and configuring it for, for each client yep. as we go along. So, I saw someone else had a hand up. Yeah. Uh, just so I understand, this sounds like to me uh, a competing product with SkySpark? Yes. Okay. But so SkySpark would fall in that FDD 1.0. Write rules, maintain rules, hundreds and thousands of them. The implementation takes forever. You need a wide, deep staff to do it or deep pockets to hire that consultant. That's the essence of it. Do you allow your customers to write their own algorithms? Um, do do we'll, we'll let people in yeah. to, to, to change the analytics. Yeah. Most people pop up a support window, uh, and Carl Samara, our director of service, is saying, hey, Carl, you know, this was because yeah. of an occupancy, to, yep. and we'll do it. You, yep. you can do yep. it, but most folks would yep. rather have us do it for them. It's part of the service. Yep. We're at 3.30, because I know the next session, but Mike and I will stay up here, so anyone yeah. else will come yep. up here. Uh, I want to make sure you guys can make it to your next session. I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions or talk to you guys a little bit more. But, Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>